All right, welcome to day five. We are going to do log applications today. So some of the problems are going to require logs. Some of them might require bapping. Um, it all depends on the scenario. And all of them are different types of applications that you might utilize log properties with. Um, so let's kick it off with number one, see what we're in store. Uh, the number of milligrams D of a drug remaining in a patient's bloodstream T hours after it has been administered is given by the following equation. To the nearest minute, how long will it take until only 2.5 milligrams of the drug remains in the system? So since T is already, or sorry, T is in hours, when we solve for T, just keep in mind that if we want to the nearest minute, we're going to have to convert that at the end. So um, we are going to set this equal to 2.5 because that's what we want to know how long it takes to decay. So we're going to set the equation that's given equal to 2.5 and solve for T. And you, this has the parentheses on the outside. I'm just going to put that there because that looks a little bit more familiar, I think. All right, so 2.5 divided by 5 is a half. So we're going to set this to 0.5 because if I divide and divide, that's where the, five, the 0.5 is coming from. Okay, so 2.7 to the negative 0.4t. All right, just like yesterday, we cannot get common bases in this way, so we have to use logs. So let's turn it into a log. Log base answer power. So log base answer power, we bapped it. So let's type that in. Log base, let me see if I can get this in the screen. Yep, 2.7 of 0.5. We're going to take this answer and divide it by negative 0.4. So let's divide by negative 0.4. So that means T is 1.7446 hours. I need to convert this to minutes. So to do that, because that's what it wants it in, to the nearest minute, so I'm going to multiply by the fact that there's 60 minutes in an hour. So multiply by 60, and that's going to be approximately 105 minutes. That's our final answer for that one. So we just had to make sure that the units matched. Originally it had told us hours, but it wanted the answer in minutes. So that's the only reason why I'm converting and multiplying by 60. All right, number two. The Richter scale measures the magnitude of an earthquake. It is defined by the following crazy looking formula, but it's honestly not as crazy as you would think. Here's our log. All it has is a coefficient. We have a coefficient in front of our variable on the inside of the log, and then we have just a shift up, 1.46. So it's just a log equation. E, the capital E here, represents the energy released by an earthquake. And in 1933, the quake in Japan measured 8.9 on the Richter scale. In scientific notation, rounded to three decimal places, how much energy was released. So the fact that this is 8.9 on the Richter scale, that is going to go in for R. And it wants to know how much energy was released. That means we are going to be solving for the capital E. So we're going to set this equation equal to 8.9. So give me a second while I write this all down. And so unlike example one, where we had to turn it into a log, this one already is a log. So my mind is already focused on the fact that we're going to eventually lasso this, but I can't lasso it right now. I have to isolate first. So when we are solving equations, you should always start with either adding or subtracting if possible. So in this case, I can add the 1.46 to the other side and get rid of that first. That's going to give us, or I'm sorry, subtract 1.46. So we get 7.44. I'm going to rewrite the whole thing over again so I don't lose anyone. All right, and we still have to do some isolating. I still have to divide by that 0.67 to finish up our um, isolating. 
Let's see what that is. 7.44 divided by 0.67. It might not be a cute decimal. Um, so instead of kind of having to write all that down, you should always kind of see if it math fracks. And if it does, that's way simpler to write down. So I'm just going to write that down. 744 over 67. So 744 over 67 is equal to log of 0.37 e. All right, I finally have isolated my log. I can now lasso my log. And remember, if it's the word log and the invisible base is a 10, so I'm going to take that 10, loop that, and raise it to that fractional exponent, and it's equal to 0.37e. So let's see what that is. 10 raised to our fraction, hit enter, take that answer and divide by 0.37. All right, so I divided by 0.37. Now I want to point something out to you that you may not have noticed. The direction says, in scientific notation, to three decimal places. In your result, there is this E. This capital E, unlike our, you know, E from PERT or natural logs that have a base E, that's a lowercase E. This is a capital E. This capital E is scientific notation. So when this is saying round to three decimal places, this is saying, okay, 3.438 times 10 to the 11th power. That would be how much energy was released in that earthquake in Japan in 1933. So E11 is times 10 to the 11, and then the three decimal places are just coming from normal rounding in the calculator. All right, cool. So if you ever see that E, that means you got a really, really, really big number. Like think about this, this would be 11 decimal place swings. That's a lot. If it's ever a negative exponent, like E, and then it says like negative 11, then that means the decimal swinging this way 11, and that's a really, really small number. So that's what the E in your calculator means when you get that answer. Number three. The following function models the population of a city t years after 2010. Is this population increasing or decreasing, and how do you know? Well, first of all, it's a base e, so it's pert. So we know that e is a positive number, but this sneaky little negative up there means that the rate is negative. So if the rate at which it's um, growing or decaying, in this case decaying, is negative, the entire function is decreasing then. Okay, and one way you could check that, um, you could honestly just type that equation in the graph, in the y equals, hit graph, and, and you would see it would be decreasing. Um, you could absorb that negative if you wanted to, so like really e raised to the negative 0.035 that's a number less than one. So technically the base of your exponent is less than one. So it's decreasing. Part B says, if this rate continues, how many years will it take for the population to get down to 10,000, round to the nearest 10th? Well, right now, assuming that this is representing our population of a city, so right now it's at 55. I wanna know how long it's gonna take down to get to 10,000. So we're gonna set it equal to 10,000. Oh, it's a zero three five. I gotta put that zero in there. Okay, isolate. So divide by the fifty five thousand. That's gone. Ten over fifty five. You can reduce that. So if you're, if you don't know what I mean, I do this again. Math frac if possible, because it'll kind of condense it if if it can be. So two over eleven e to the negative 0 0.035. I don't want to forget that zero again. And it's an exponential. Turn it into a log. If this is a base e, we need a natural log. So natural log of our invisible base e, 2 elevenths equals negative 0 0.035t. Let's figure out what this is and round to the nearest tenth. All right, so natural log of 2 divided by 11 Take that answer and divide it by negative 0 0.035. 
So divide by negative 0 0.035 and round to the nearest tenth. So about 48.7 uh, years, I guess. Cool. All right. Next page, we're going to bring back some of our old friends from earlier in the year. So recall from unit seven, our exponentials unit, we have PERT, which we used yesterday. We have the middle one that we used yesterday. We use the subtraction option. And then if it says compounded, let's say monthly, weekly, uh, semi-annually, something like that, that's the one with the N. The Juarez family has $20,000 to invest and wants to save $32,000 by the time their son starts college. They expect their investment to earn an average of 0.06, so 6% a year, compounded quarterly, that would be four times a year. In how many years to the nearest year will they reach their goal? All right, so I saw the word compounded and then quarterly, so I'm going to use this third formula here. They are investing $20,000. That is their initial investment. And they want to know how much time has to go by to get it up to or after a certain amount of time to 32000 So I'm going to set it equal to 32000 They're investing 20000 Just filling in our, our uh, what we know. The exponent is an NT, so that's 4 times T because it's 4 times a year. And we're solving for t. All right, let's start isolating. So just like we have been over the last few days, divide if possible. So in this case, it is 32,000 divided by 20,000. And my calculator is giving me 1.6. So you are more than welcome to math frack that, but 1.6 is not a bad decimal. So I'm just going to kind of leave that. I'm also going to clean this up the inside, uh, 0 0.06 divided by 4 plus the 1. So I'm just figuring out what this base is equivalent to um, so that I can write that in a more concise way. All right, I am as isolated and cleaned up as I can get it. So let's turn it into a log. Log base answer power. So log math alpha math 1.015 of 1.6. This is what I get. I'm going to divide that answer by 4. And I get 7.891. Da, 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 da. How many years to the nearest year? About eight years they need to invest to get their uh, money up to that amount. So number five is actually an interesting take on these because they don't give you a starting amount. They just give you sort of a relationship between the starting amount and what you want it to get up to. So let's read it so you know what I'm talking about. The number of bacteria present after T minutes is modeled by the following function. So we have a base, we have an exponent, but this N sub zero is representing the initial number of bacteria present, but they're not giving us a tangible number. Like we're starting with 10 or we're starting with 100. It's just like mm, n sub zero is how much we started with. It says in how many minutes to the nearest minute will the bacteria double in number? So you could honestly pick any amount in the world. Like if I picked 10, then I would want to know how long it takes for it to get up to 20. If I pick five, or let me pick a different option, 100, then it would be 200. So whatever you start with, you are hoping that in this spot, it is double the initial amount. So you could honestly keep it in terms of n sub zero. If n sub zero represents our initial amount, then double that would be two times n sub zero. Really? Or like I said, you can pick Let's just pick a random amount, 10. So if I want double that, then I would set it equal to 20. Regardless, I'm just picking a random number. So if you're looking at this and be like, where'd the 10 come from? I'm just picking a random amount and then doubling it. Because no matter what you pick, 
I'm going to end up dividing that 10 to the other side, and it ends up getting set equal to 2. So if you ever get some relationship where it says double, you're just going to set your relationship equal to 2. If that's a triple, I would set it equal to 3. I don't need to know how much I started with as long as I know the relationship between where I started and how much I'm ending with, I can just set it equal to that relationship. If it said half, I would just set it equal to half the amount I started with and so on. All right, so now that I got rid of that 10 that I came up with on my own, I can go right ahead and turn this into a log. Log, base, answer, power. So log base 3 of 2 is this. If you put that over 1, you can easily see that I can cross multiply to solve for t. So I'm going to multiply that by 20. And I would get 12.618 dot 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 in how many minutes to the nearest minute? So about 13 minutes it would take. <coughs> Sorry. OK. Fun times with this next question. Okay. We're talking about a turkey. And if I was brave enough, I would do my turkey call. But I won't. All right. So after sitting out of the refrigerator for a while, a turkey at room temperature 68 degrees is placed into an oven at 8 a.m. The oven temperature is 325. Newton's law of heating explains that the temperature of the turkey will increase proportionally to the difference between the temperature of the turkey and the temperature of the oven as given by the following formula. You do not need to memorize this formula. You also do not need to memorize all these different T's because notice this is T sub A, T sub zero, baby T, capital T, and then K. You don't have to memorize what they mean, what they represent, and you don't have to memorize this. But there will definitely be one of these on your test, okay? And they have been known to put questions like this on the Regents exam. So let's reread all the different components that they're giving us information about. Because if you read part A, they give us even more. The turkey reaches the temperature of 100 degrees after two hours, find the value of K. So obviously we're not supposed to get information about K because that's what they're asking us to find in part A. So let's figure out all the T's. T sub A is the temperature surrounding the object. So remember, we put the turkey in the oven. So the oven temperature is 325 degrees. So that is T sub A. T sub zero is how uh, what would the initial temperature of the object? In this case, the object, again, is a turkey. And it says a turkey was sitting at room temperature that is 68 degrees. So we're going to assume the turkey is the same temperature because it's been sitting out for a really long time. Then down in question A, it says after two hours. So the amount of time that's gone by is two hours. And then capital T, the temperature of the object after those hours, so the turkey reaches a temperature of 100 degrees after the two hours went by. That is capital T. So we're just reading, okay, and, and figuring out what each variable would be represented by. K is the one we don't know. So we have 100 is equal to 325 plus parentheses T sub 0, so 68, minus T sub A, which is the 325 again. E to the negative, and then up here we have a K baby T. K is what we're trying to find, and then baby T is 2, so 2 K. All I did was plug in what we know into our formula, and then we have to isolate, just like we have been for the last two days. So I'm going to do some cleaning up here. First thing maybe I would do is subtract the 325 over. Okay, so now we have negative 225. And also, I can subtract these two things. So 68 minus 325 is our coefficient in front of the E. So just do this subtraction. And if you do that, you get negative 257. Cool. Let's keep solving. Divide. That, uh, I'm going to 
leave that because I think 225 divided by 257, because obviously a negative divided by a negative is a positive, so I'm just going to divide these numbers. This is not cute, and it also doesn't reduce, so I'm just going to leave it as 225 divided by 257 just for logging purposes. Okay, so we have it isolated. Let's turn it into a log. So this is natural log of our base E that we don't really write. The fraction is equal to negative 2K. Solve for K. And now K is a constant. So once we figure it out for this example, it will be the same for anything else in this example. But anytime the parameters change, you would have to refine that k constant. So there's no point in memorizing this k value because it's going to be different for every single turkey problem <laughs> that I ever give you. Um, but the procedure to solve it is the same. So I'm typing my natural log of that fraction. I'm going to divide it by negative 2. And it says round it to the nearest thousandth, which is three decimal places. So 0, 6, 6. So there is our k constant. And part B says using your answer from k, or from part A, or the value you got for k, determine the temperature of coffee. I think that's supposed to say the turkey. The turkey after a half an hour round to the nearest degree. All right, so let's figure out what the temperature of our turkey, in this case, should be. Um, all the answers, all the variables are in the same places. Okay, so T sub 0 minus T sub A E to the negative. So we want after a half an hour instead of after two hours. All right, so after half an hour, we need to convert that to 30 minutes. Half an hour would be 0.5 of an hour. All right, so negative 0 0.066 times 0 0.5. I know I'm squeezing that in there. All right, 68 minus 325 E to the negative 0 0.066 times a half an hour would be 0.5. There we go. Our turkey only gets up to about 76 degrees-ish, which kind of makes sense because in part A, in two hours, the turkey was 100 degrees. So if we're only cooking it at this point for a half an hour, it should not be more than 100 degrees because we're trying to warm it up and cook it. So that makes sense. All right, last little bit we have to get through today. And I know this video is a little bit longer than the other ones is half life. So half life is something you probably talked about in science class and in science all the ratios are probably nice equivalent increments of time. Um, but now that we know logs we can find half-life, we can find halfway between two half-lives if we wanted to, because not everything counts in terms of exact, in this case, 15-year increments. What if I want to know, like, 20 years and how much is left of a substance? So half-life is the amount of time that it takes for half of the substance to decay. So our first example says the pesticide DDT was widely used in the United States until it was banned in 1972. It is a toxic, it's very toxic to a wide range of animals and aquatic life. And the half-life of it is 15 years. So if we started with 1,000 grams, let's say when we initially started we had 1,000 grams, then in one half-life, a.k.a. 15 years, there'd still be 500 grams. And then in 30 years, so a second half-life, it would still have 250, and it would just keep cutting in half. So every 15 years, or every half-life, it would just keep cutting in half, and cutting in half, and cutting in half, which, if you think about it, it'll never go away. It'll just keep cutting in half. And a lot of times this is how, you know, scientists carbon date things. That's how they know how old certain petrified trees are or dinosaurs and things like that. So here's our half-life formula. 
same letters as always, A and P, and since we're cutting it in half, the base is 0.5. Our exponent is how much time goes by divided by the number of half-lives. So if it helps you remember this, it's Tim Hortons, T over H. All right, so write an exponential function that represents the amount of DDT left after T years. So remember, we initially started, and our initial amount was 1,000. So A sub T, or A of T, we started with 1,000. 1,000 grams, it is cutting in half, and the amount of time is divided by 15 year increments, because that's our half-life amount. So using your formula from part A, how much will be left after eight years? So eight years isn't even one full half-life. So eight years, we have 1,000 grams, it's cutting in half, eight years divided by 15. We type that in our calculator, and it wants nearest hundredth, so 1,000. 0.5 raised to the 8 divided by 15, nearest hundredth would actually, oh, hundredth to silly, silly me. There we go. Hundredth is two decimal places, not nearest tenth. All right, part C. At what time will there be 100 grams of DDT? Okay, let's actually go back to our little flow chart. 100 is going to be somewhere between 250 and 125. Nope, I lied. Somewhere between 125 and 62. Ignore that. It's going to be somewhere in here. So I'm expecting so maybe 50-something years. Let's find out. At what time? So T is what we're solving for. I'm setting it equal to 100. So 100 equals 1,000.5 to the t over 15, just like we have been over the last few days, isolate log base 0.5 of 0.1 equals t over 15. So let's figure out what that is. Log oh, base 0.5 of 0.1 Put that over 1 and cross multiply. Ooh, look at me. Rounded to the nearest hundredth, so about 49.8 years. So, man, I was almost spot on by guessing 50. I swear I didn't even cheat by looking at the answer key. All right. Number two. You're observing a radioactive isotope, a mystery. At 4 p.m., there's 2.5 grams. And at 9 p.m., there's 1.7 grams. So hopefully you agree that it is decaying over time. What is the half-life? Round your answer to the nearest hour. Okay, so you're observing a radioactive isotope. At 4 is our starting time, and 9 is when our next result is occurring. That is a difference of 5 hours. So we're going to use that for T, because that's how much time has gone by. We're also going to assume that 2.5 is going to be the only information we have about our initial amount, and 1.7 is the only information we have about our after amount. And literally the question is, what is the half-life? So H is clearly what we're trying to solve for in this question. So if we're going to set it equal to 1.7. Our half-life, so the base is 0.5. You don't even have to think about it. And our exponent is now Tim Hortons. So time divided by half-lives, and H is what we're trying to solve for. So just like we have been, divide, divide. So 1.7 divided by 2.5 in your calculator is 0.68. 5 over H. Divide by 2.5 equals 0.68. Let's turn this into a log. So log base 5 of 0.68 equals 5 over h. All right. So log base 0.68. Okay. Now, this one, I'm still going to cross multiply. But if you notice, my cross multiplying, this is 1 times 5. And then we get h times all that. Whenever this happens, and this is kind of a little shortcut, these two, the h and our log, are essentially switching places because I would be multiplying 
and then dividing the log to solve for h, right? I would divide by this log, I would divide by the log of all that stuff. So really what I'm doing is I'm swapping these spots. So I need to do 5 divided by our answer, and that rounded to the nearest hour is about 9 hours. Our last one. A piece of charcoal is found to contain 30% of carbon-14 that it originally had. When did the tree from which the charcoal came from die? Use 5,600 years as the half-life of carbon-14. So this is H. Pretty much the only information we're given is H. But it does tell us that it has 30% of its original carbon. And if you remember from the example on the last page when it said the word double, when was that? That was on one of our examples. Oh, number five. On number five, when it said double, we said double set equal to two. If it said triple, set equal to three. This says it's 30%. I'm not given an amount but I know the relationship has to be 30% of the original. So you could just like pick a random amount. Like if I picked a random amount, let's say 100, and then the after amount would be 30% of that 100, then I would set it equal to 30, Ooh, regular 30. But again, I'm going to then divide by 100 because that's my initial amount. 30% is 0.3. That is my after amount because that's the relationship of some imaginary or unknown initial and an unknown after amount. I just know the relationship has to be 30% of it. So I'm going to set it equal to 0.30 or 0.3. My half-life is 0.5 raised to the T Tim Hortons. I don't know how much time. That's what it's asking me to find. Round to the nearest year. So T is what we're trying to find. My log, or I'm sorry, my exponential is isolated, so I'm going to log it. Base, answer, power, cool. Put that over a 1, and I can do normal cross multiplication on this one. So math alpha math, 0. 0.5 of 0. 0.3. I get this, and then I multiply that by 5,600 and I am able to solve for how much time to the nearest year, so 9727 years. All right. Bye.